Hello. Welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. Okay, before we get into the episode, a few items here. I have uh, migrated over to Substack. Um, you can get the podcast on all platforms still. Uh, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you listen. But it's also through Substack. A um, few reasons why I've done this. I've been kicking this around for really months. Um, I've realized I wanted to get people, um, you know, kind of like a, a, an email list going of sorts to really know um, my audience better and to curate you know, um, conversations that are really pulling for that. You know, everyone that listens is fantastic and is great. And they kind of come for the ride, you know, for whatever, uh, the next episode is, but I really wanted to try and, um, you know, really kind of isolate what is, what is the, the demand? What are people really interested in? And, um, you know, again, all my listeners are wonderful. And so, I um, mean, there's more interactive features there. Uh, many people are familiar with Substack and their, the way they use podcasts is pretty good. And so I'm there. So converging dialogues at substack.com. Uh, subscribe. It's free. Nothing's changed. You don't have to do anything. You just subscribe. We'd love to, to get you on there and uh, engage with you. And, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great way, you know, in the, in the future, in the future, I may do some paid Walt stuff, but for the most part and for the foreseeable future, I want to just keep getting this out there for people, um, these conversations, I think it's important and I would never want, um, money to be a, uh, a hindrance. I don't do this for money. I don't, that's not why I'm doing this. Um, and so, you know, it's really having good conversations, exchange of ideas, um, informational, educational, et cetera. Um, so everything still stays the same. So hope to hope to see you uh, there and subscribe. Today I am talking with the one and only Jeffrey Miller. Uh, Jeffrey is a evolutionary psychologist. Um, he has a bachelor's in biology and um, psychology from Columbia. He has a PhD in cognitive psychology from Stanford, and he's a tenured associate professor at the University of New Mexico. He has many publications on sexual selection, mate choice, fitness indicators, creativity, arts, many, many different topics. Um, and he is the author of a handful of books. Um, most notable, I would say, is probably The Mating Mind. Um, and this is much of what we, we talk about in the conversation. We start the conversation by talking about natural selection and sexual selection and kind of give an overview and kind of his way of how he describes that. We talk about why sexual selection was lost to history for many years. We talk about mate choice, pair bonding, uh, cold and hot choosers. We talk about um, sexual ornaments and ornamentation in general. We talk about the ornamental mind and mate retention. And we spend a good amount of time talking about polyamorous relationships. This is something that Jeffrey has uh, done a lot of work on. We talk about the moral and ethical and emotional aspects of polyamorous relationships and the role of commitment here. And then we shift gears. We talk about effective altruism uh, and the connection with artificial intelligence research. We talk about the alignment problem of AI, many of the ethics there, morals there. And towards the end, we talk about uh, libertarianism. This is uh, where where Jeffrey finds his political home, and he talks about that. And um, and many other topics. I, I have to say, I mean, I've, I've followed, <laughs> I say in the conversation, Jeffrey's work for a long time. I mean, I've read some of his stuff when I was in grad school. So it's, it's, uh, it was a really big honor to, to talk with Jeffrey. Um, he's absolutely wonderful to talk to, uh, really has a, a great way of distilling all these ideas and stuff he's just been thinking about for so long. And, and he's a, he's a great conversationalist. Um, uh, I really could, talk to him for, for hours and hours and hours of really outside the box thinking, uh, really novel thinker in many ways. And, um, it was a absolutely fantastic conversation. And so now I bring you Jeffrey Miller. I am here with Jeffrey Miller. Uh, Jeffrey, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I've, uh, been looking forward to talking to you and, uh, I think we'll have a fun conversation. Yeah. Great to be here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm sure many people will know who you are, uh, but for those that don't, just uh, 
give us the thumbnail version of you. What's your background? Uh, what have you written on and talked about? And what are you currently thinking about? I'm an evolutionary psychology professor at University of New Mexico. Um, I did a BA at Columbia and a PhD at Stanford, and I worked a bunch of different places. I've counted up. I've worked at like a dozen different you know, universities and research centers over the years, but I've been mostly at University of New Mexico for the last 20 years. And I work a lot on uh, the kind of origins and nature of human sexuality, particularly how we choose our mates, how we fall in love, what we look for in mates, how relationships form. And uh, lately, I've been pivoting a little bit more into uh, a broader set of issues around existential risks to humanity, which is a somewhat depressing topic, but mm. important. Yeah. And also recently, a little bit on artificial intelligence, safety, and what's called the alignment problem. How do we get AI systems to behave in alignment with human values and interests? Mm -hmm. And I've done uh, a bunch of papers and five books over the years. Uh, I guess the most notable books are The Mating Mind, which analyzed uh, human evolution from a sexual selection perspective, and Spent in 2008, which analyzed sort of evolutionary consumer behavior mm. and runaway consumerism and capitalism and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And most recently, a little book called Virtue Signaling. Mm -hmm. which is about how we kind of show off our uh, moral virtues and political ideals to mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Yeah, I was, uh, I was, I reread the Matey Mind, uh, uh, you know, preparing for this, and um, I can't believe it's over 20 years old. Um, that's crazy to think. <laughs> I remember first reading it in grad school, and so I'm like, my goodness, like, you know, it feels like I just read this, you know, so um, I guess that just means we're both getting old. I guess that's what it means. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think every author is <laughs> often ends up being astonished about like how oh my god how long ago i wrote that thing and yeah um what percent of it do i still endorse <laughs> you know is often an, an issue sure yeah yeah well i mean look at least from a reader's perspective having read it you know at least once before and reading it now many years later um i feel it still holds up uh i think it's very still very readable and a lot of stuff is wonderful in there so um, Thanks. I yeah, appreciate it's, that. It's 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 kind of a in my mind it's a classic, so it's very very good. Okay, so just kind of with that, um, most of the book is on uh, the main mind is on um, a lot of it's on sexual selection, which I want to talk to you about, but uh, in spe specific features there. So you just kind of give us just a and I've talked about this in other conversations, but just on your vantage point, how do you usually explain? Uh, natural selection, and then kind of sex, sexual selection, uh, just general overview, and then we'll, we'll uh, dive into the uh, specifics of sexual selection. Yeah, if you think about, you know, the basic Darwinian insight that, you know, heritable traits and, and genes get passed along. So all of us alive today are uh, success stories. We are the outcome of all of our ancestors going back hundreds of millions of years, managing to survive and reproduce successfully. If they hadn't, they wouldn't be our ancestors. Mm -hmm. So all the genes we get are kind of a, a success story. They're the, the last genes standing in a way. Mm -hmm. And Darwin's great insight was, okay, there's natural selection, which is competition for survival. You have to, uh, you know, find stuff to eat, avoid predators, avoid parasites, and keep your body intact long enough to reproduce. But Darwin also pointed out there's sexual selection, which is competition to get mates and to reproduce. And that, to me, is a really interesting process because mate choice is mediated by animal brains. It's mm -hmm. mediated by animals looking and, and, and hearing each other, choosing who do I want to mate with. Um, and a lot of that is based on, you know, what traits do those potential mates have that I could potentially pass along to my offspring? Hmm. So evolution does not just shape us to survive, it also shapes us to reproduce, to attract mates, to choose mates effectively. And when I first started thinking about this stuff, oh my God, way back in grad school, honestly, hmm. circa 1988, 89, hmm. when I first got a little, a little obsessed with sexual selection theory, <laughs> um, I thought this is kind of a neglected evolutionary process, honestly. A lot of people at the time were focusing on the benefits of, of big human brains in terms of things like hunting and gathering and warfare and aggression and 
uh, theory of mind, understanding each other's uh, beliefs and desires. And I thought that's all great. That's all valid. Survival is a big issue for all species. However, <laughs> however, it looks like we have this kind of caricature of prehistoric life, right? That maybe mate choice wasn't that important somehow. That either there was a lot of sexual coercion, you know, men just taking women, <clears throat> or maybe there was a lot of arranged marriage where parents were sort of choosing, you know, who's, who's going to, you know, get together with my son or daughter. Um, and people weren't really thinking that there was a lot of scope for mate choice. But in my view, reading, uh, reading the anthropological literature, it looked like there was actually quite a bit of um, elbow room for our ancestors to choose, you know, which among the available people in the nearby environment do I really want to mate with? Mm. You know, who's got attractive, important, useful traits to me that could be passed along? Mm. Of course, that doesn't have to be conscious. Evolution just shapes us. Uh, to have the mate choice criteria, uh, the mate choice selectivity that happens to be useful. So when you know female birds are choosing male birds who have big song repertoires and can sing loudly and often and with great energy and creatively, the female birds aren't consciously thinking, well, okay, let's connect the dots. If he sings with that amount of energy, that means he's healthy, he's got low parasite load, he's, he's a successful forager, um, therefore, my sons and daughters in turn will be... No, they're not thinking that consciously. Their brains are just shaped by selection mm. to choose the mates who happen to have traits that end up being useful. Mm. And I thought, you know, the same thing could happen with humans. And that was, that was kind of the genesis of that. In, in this way, you, you, it's been talked about before, but why did this... You know, Darwin talked about sexual selection you know, many, many years ago. And it was almost like a, was it 80, 100, 120 years where people just didn't talk about it. Right. And then <clears throat> people started to say, wait a minute, you know, he, the sense of man, he spends, you know, 600 pages of the 900 <laughs> talking about sexual selection. Why don't, why don't we examine this and see what's going on? I mean, was, was there a lot of other things at play there? I mean, what was the big reason? You know, we can't do what ifs of, you know, what would have happened in that time. But, you know, now that we finally do and we have many uh, good theories and models for sexual selection now, how do we, outside of it, how do, you know, why do you think it was just ignored and, and where do you think it helps us currently today uh, for understanding organisms on the planets and then for understanding humans? Well, in the mating mind, I made the argument that a lot of it boiled down to sexism honestly. Mm. You know, Darwin made the point, look, female mate choice, mate choice by female animals drove a lot of evolution. And he was incredibly foresighted. I think that's an amazing insight. But a lot of other biologists at the time in the Victorian era, I think, had the view that evolution is far too serious a business to be left in the, in the, in the hands or the brains of mere female animals. Mm -hmm. Like, they, they shouldn't be in the driver's seat. They shouldn't be selecting uh, all these male traits. That uh, somehow makes evolution by natural selection less of a, um, a kind of serious business. And so I think partly it was an ideological kind of sexist thing. Mm. But I think also there were legitimate... Um, issues of trying to model how this stuff would work. I mean, it took a while, you know, between Darwin and 1859, first publishing about sexual selection, and Sir Ronald A. Fisher in 1915, starting to do the first mathematical models of sexual selection, right? And then it took another uh, 60 or so years before you get um, Amat Zahavi and other biologists in the 70s doing mm -hmm. kind of serious mathematical modeling of how this stuff could work. Mm. So partly it was a technical problem. Um, and then partly I think it was an experimental biology problem of people not really knowing how to do uh, lab experiments or field experiments to see, are, are these animals actually choosing mates? How, you know, how would you do that? It took the rise of experimental biology and ethology in the 1950s um, to kind of figure out, oh, wow, we can actually study this stuff empirically. 
Hmm. And ever since about the 1970s and 80s, there's been, you know, thousands of papers a year studying animal mate choice, hmm. um, empirically, theoretically, mathematically, and so forth. Hmm. So I think the history could have gone different. We could have had hmm. sexual selection applied more seriously to human evolution, potentially 50 years earlier <laughs> than, yeah. than actually happened. Mm -hmm. That would have been cool. Um, but I think it's such a, a compelling and correct idea that, you know, it would have happened sooner or later that we'd go, oh yeah, mate choice is important in human life. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess uh, let, uh, let's talk about it, right? So in terms of a mate choice, I think one of the prevailing ideas for a while was that the females are the ones that do the choosing of, of, of mates, you know, of males, um, you know, for reproduction and for other uses. But that's not the whole picture there, right? So we understand that there's a, there's a, maybe not a mutual choosing, but there's a co-evolution that's going on, right? So as mate or females choose males, males then are evolving certain types of sexual ornamentation or there's certain features, you know, and as that goes through generation, there's a kind of, uh, you know, kind of give and take here. Um, so I guess just kind of just talk about that and you can bring up uh, Zahavi's handicap principle and Fisher's fitness indicator, all these things. So just maybe just discuss more of the details of how we understood how mate choice worked and then now how we understand how a little bit more uh, works uh, more robustly. Yeah, I think Darwin, you know, correctly observed that in the vast majority of, of, of let's say, mammal species, 7,000 or so species of mammals, it's mostly females choose and males compete. Um, males aren't very choosy and females aren't very competitive. And there's a big dimorphism, a big sex difference in how mm -hmm. choosy uh, males versus females are in most species. That's also true in most of the 300 odd species of primates. Uh, mostly the males aren't very choosy. Mm -hmm. But humans are really unusual. We're more kind of like uh, socially monogamous birds. Mm -hmm in a lot of ways in terms of our uh, kind of sexual choice patterns than we are like other primates or other mammals. So once you get the evolution of kind of long-term pair bonds, which probably happened a few million years ago in, in humans, mm -hmm. you can tell because there's a reduced size difference between males and females. Before that, right, males were much, much larger than females. That's typical when you have what's called a highly polygynous species where there's really intense male physical competition, like four resources, four territories, four mates. But once female uh, size catches up to males, mm. right? Our, our female ancestors got uh, almost as big as our male ancestors, right? only about a 10% height difference now. That suggests they started forming these long-term pair bonds mm. to raise kids together um, with input and support from the males in terms of hunting and protection and, and some child care. And then suddenly, suddenly, there's an incentive for males to be choosy, mm. right? Because males are focusing a lot of their reproductive effort on uh, one female at a time, typically, mm -hmm. right? Now, there's always been high status, high dominance males who had multiple mates. But I suspect that you know most of our ancestors were producing most of their babies in these long-term pair bonds mm. that were formed through mutual mate choice mm. and suddenly that makes everything different right that means whatever the females are choosing for in the males will evolve but also whatever the males are choosing for in the females will evolve mm. so there's a a kind of um naive like sophomore biology view that oh sexual selection is only useful in explaining sex differences mm. and if the sexes don't have a sex difference that means mate choice is not relevant that's wrong that's dumb that's not how sexual yeah. selection works in pair bonds you can have both males and females choosing the same kinds of traits mm -hmm. in each other and those traits can be amplified and can evolve very very quickly um, without showing big sex differences. Mm. And I think that's what, what actually happened in terms of uh, explaining some of the evolution of human intelligence, language, creativity, art, music, moral virtues, those kinds of traits. Mm. If they're important in both sexes, 
when they're falling in love, choosing a long-term mate, and deciding, <laughs> this is crucial, deciding whether to stay with a long-term mate mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. rather than yeah. getting bored, right. wandering off, right? Any of those traits that are under selection by both sexes can evolve quickly to very high levels to be sexually attractive, to be romantically compelling. Mm. And I think that, that explains you know, a fair number of human uh, mental capacities that are kind of hard to explain through other processes. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit from what I wanted to ask later, but uh, I'll ask it now since since you're, it seems relevant here, which is, so let me make sure I get this right. Because, because the more of the mutual choosing here through evolutionary time, that occurred because we had either a type of serial monogamy or some type of monogamy where we have these long-term pair bondings. That's the, that's the claim, at least. Yeah. But what about the the information we know about, um, you know, if you go back 300,000 years, we were very polygynous, and then we go back to monogamous, and then we go to polygynous, and now we're back to monogamy, you know, more currently. You see a lot of these kind of ebbs and flows of, of where uh, various human species are, are operating in terms of how they're doing pair bonding. How would that kind of claim fit with how we understand those kind of epochs? Yeah, this is a, this is a crucial thing that it's, you know, there's a simplistic version of, of this story. And then there's like the actual nitty gritty on the ground version of it. And okay. you're right, there's been this ebb and flow between like periods and epochs when there was a very high degree of polygyny and a few dominant high status, high prestige men with a lot of power, influence, uh, you know, capacity for, for violence kind of dominated, you know, local little harems or got together with bands mm-hmm. of other men and they go around marauding and, you know, killing men in other tribes and taking their mm-hmm. women. There have been plenty of times like that. Um, the Bronze Age was probably very much like that. Sure. And we have the genetic evidence that, you know, the effective sex ratio in the Bronze Age, at least in Europe, was extremely skewed. And only a few, only a small percentage of the men accounted for a, a large number of the births. Mm. So you do, you do get these times when there's really intense sexual selection on male capacities for, um, violence and warfare and domination and banding together with other groups of men to kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, maximize the reproductive success by any means possible. However, I think a more typical situation throughout most of prehistory, most of the Pleistocene was most people forming pair bonds, right? A few males who can't attract anybody, being the incels and dying without any kids. That's always happened. Mm-hmm. And then a, a, a you know, upper stratum of men um, getting multiple ma- mates, either at the same time or, or in, in sequence. Um, and, you know, what I'm looking for is it would be great to have a little more detailed uh, molecular genetic evidence mm-hmm. about exactly how this plays out. And... Um, I think the data are out there and what I would love to see is maybe more, more collaboration between evolutionary psychologists, mm-hmm. evolutionary anthropologists, evolutionary geneticists, trying to figure out, can we trace the genetic signatures mm-hmm. of kind of um, how much pair bonding was there versus mm-hmm. how much polygyny was there? Mm-hmm. And I know which way I'd bet, you know, I, I kind of think it's, it's like roughly about 70% sexual selection in pair bonds and then 30% polygyny. Mm-hmm. Other people might reverse that. But I think within 10 or 20 years, we'll have a pretty good idea from uh, the genetic evidence pretty directly about how that all played out. Mm. Yeah, I think it's interesting. It's fascinating as we, we still have you know, people that will continue to do this you know, with behavior genetics and you know, anthropologists and, and evolutionary biologists and people are doing these, these various types of things and we're finding new things all the time. Um, you know, there's been some, 
uh, I feel like every every month I, I turn around and there's some some new finding, there's some new data, both on the genetic side or the fossil record or whatever of, of um, you know, humans in the Americas, right? We just keep finding, we keep putting that, pushing that date back. There was something a week or two ago about that. And <laughs> it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's kind of like a live ball in that sense. Um, you talk about this, uh, this is, this is wrong, make choice. You talk about in the book, these uh, cold choosers and hot choosers, right? So could you describe or explain this since we're here on make choice? Yeah, cold chooser would be kind of like a, a it's almost like an Asperger-y approach to mate choice where mm-hmm. it's almost like you make a mental like Excel spreadsheet of, of here's my potential mates in the in the you know the rows and then the columns are like all their traits and you estimate their traits and you kind of add them up with some like weighted <laughs> linear model and you go, okay, this this mate is probably the best. I, I literally know people who've done this in, mm-hmm. in their dating lives. Me too. Uh, but it's, it's not a majority strategy. <laughs> the hot choosers are those who are just more intuitive, right? And they just meet people and they respond to their traits the way that like a female bird would respond to male bird song, passionately, mm-hmm. emotionally, um, being, feeling fascinated and compelled. Mm-hmm. by whatever traits are of interest. And this might be physical traits, like, mm-hmm. oh my God, they're so beautiful, gorgeous, look mm-hmm. great, you know, sexy, sexy body, beautiful face, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it might also be mental traits, right? Mm-hmm. You might have your sapiosexual mm-hmm. people who are attracted to intelligence going, mm-hmm. oh my God, like, they're, they're so smart, clever, insightful, such a high index, so many citations. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> um, or more typically, you know, the intelligence might be deployed in some compelling way, like uh, telling interesting stories or jokes or mm-hmm. playing a musical instrument really well, creating cave art or modern art or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then again, you have the hot chooser going, ah, wow, that's just beautiful. That song compels me. They're a great dancer or whatever. And therefore, um, I'm attracted to them. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of got... Uh, my friend Eben Pagan, who used to be one of the, the key pickup artists, uh, where his stage name was David D'Angelo, mm-hmm. his big insight, which he slightly borrowed from me with the hot choosers, was attraction is not a choice. Mm-hmm. We call it mate choice, but it's mm-hmm. not really a choice because mm-hmm. you just feel it. You feel mm-hmm. the attraction, and then you can either act on it or not. Um, but the feeling of attraction, like you see a, a gorgeous, you know, Hollywood movie star, you can't really rationalize in, into your mind, like not thinking that they're beautiful. Like mm-hmm. you just seeing them as beautiful is a, sort of obligatory the way that our perceptual systems work. Right. Now you might override that. You might go, oh, they're a terrible person for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw an interview. They're not very smart. Um, they, they were, you know, terrible in, in that particular Avengers movie or whatever it is. Right. But the, the concept of hot choosing is, you know, a lot of this mate choice is mediated by passionate responses to other people's appearance and behavior. Mm-hmm. So uh, to that end, I mean, that this is a, a good place to talk about sexual ornamentation, which is very fascinating to me because... Um, I think we, I think exactly what you're saying. There's a, you know, you fill in the blank of whatever word you want, you know, an unconscious and implicit uh, underlying, whatever word you want to use, uh, idea of, so in your example, you know, I see somebody and they're super hot, right? They're super hot. And I don't know why I think that, I mean, that, you know, people will say like, Oh, it's my type or whatever, you know, I mean, like, you know, dark hair or, you know, you know, blonde hair or whatever, whatever the type is people have. But, but even outside of that, people will, you will kind of say, well, I, I'm not, I'm not choosing to be a, at least physically, let's say in this example, attracted to them. I just am right. You know? Um, and, and then that way, you know, there's this aspect of what is it that you're actually attracted to? Right now, of course, physically. So, of course, you can, like you're just saying, the sapiosexual thing, you know, intelligence, creativity. Okay, that's fair too. But physically, though, people, I don't know why. I just, I just am. 
I just am. So how, how much, I guess, you know, you, I think in the book, you talk about how much of our sexual quote unquote choice is mediated by our senses, right? So you, you, you've talked about, you know, in the book, you know, runaway process and fitness indicators and, but you get to this part about sexual orientation. Um, and so I guess for just in general, how do you explain the concept, I guess? And then I guess in a modern age, right? So we have our stone age brains, right? But then we have our modern brains. So how do we understand just the concept, but then how it looked different then and how it looks now, I guess? I think the, the thing to remember about perception and cognition is, you know, it's 99.999% unconscious, and we typically have no conscious access to what exact computational processing is going on in our brains, mm -hmm. what exact sensory cues we're actually paying attention to. You know, with, with facial attractiveness, people have tried to look at this in terms of like, the typicality and averageness of facial structure, the right-left symmetry of faces, mm -hmm. in particular male or female um, dimorphic indicators like the male deep-set eyes and brow ridges and the female full lips and smaller chins and noses and all that. But honestly, we, like, we still don't really know like, what separates um, you know, a super handsome guy like uh, Henry Cavill or a super attractive actress like Eva Green from a kind of only moderately attractive mm -hmm. actor. We, we, we don't know yet, but we know <laughs> there's a high degree of consensus across people about mm -hmm. who is facially or physically yes. attractive. Yes. And like, likewise with you know, behavioral traits like sense of humor, mm -hmm. if you try to analyze computationally what makes a joke funny, it's incredibly hard. It's very sure. hard to develop an artificial intelligence system that reliably produces funny jokes. Mm -hmm. People have been working on this for a long time. Um, so if you ask, like, what makes uh, Sarah Silverman or Maria Bamford or some other stand-up comedian funny, funnier than other women, you know, or what makes Dave Chappelle or um, uh, some other stand-up comedy guy funnier, it, it's very hard. And yet... And yet, if they perform in a comedy club, everybody knows who is funny and who is bombing and, and is not funny. There's, again, a high degree of consensus. Mm -hmm. We know it's based somehow on mm -hmm. something that they said mm -hmm. that people hear through their ear holes. Mm -hmm. And that's processed in your auditory cortex and other areas of the brain. Right. Um, but to me, we don't really need to know exactly how those computations work in order to just, you know, accept the obvious point that these traits matter to people. Mm -hmm. They are romantically and sexually attractive. We care about them. And uh, people who display them in better forms tend to attract more mates or higher quality mates. And then also, crucially, once they get married, if they somehow get lazy mm -hmm. and stop producing these behavioral indicators, mm -hmm. then their spouses often get bored, depressed, frustrated, go wandering off, want a divorce, etc. So, mm -hmm. you know, both in terms of the initial mate choice and then the mate retention, who do you stay with? Mm -hmm. You know, I think these traits are important. Yeah, it's interesting, right? It, it, there's obviously something going on and we don't know how, you know, we don't know how the sausage gets made necessarily, but we know it's getting made, right? And there's enough, there's enough crossover and overlap, right? I think if you ask a lot of, you know, straight women, you know, what is it about a dude that really gets you, you know, attracted to them? You know, you always hear similar things, right? Well, they make me laugh, you know, they're really smart. Um, you know, they, they're ambitious in their career and they're, you know, going after something. Um, it's not always just, you know, you know, they have broad shoulders and, you know, a, a certain jawline and, you know, they're 6'3". And I mean, those things are important too, but there's always a kind of, a kind of thing that's going on. And you could do the same for straight dudes as well. You know, what is it about, you know, a woman, you know, so this type of body, you know, this is how they are. You know, they, you know, respect me, you know, they support me. Um, they're somewhat independent in some ways, you know, whatever the kind of, you know, you know stereotypes are here, but there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap in that. Um, it's interesting how 
we can all it's it's true for like a lot of things right we know that these things exist and we know they happen because we know enough people cross culturally etc but we can't quite explain why exactly why those sexual ornaments um you know are the case for people and i think it's something that's uh, I, I definitely don't resist it, but it's definitely something that's kind of annoying. It's like, why can't we <laughs> figure this out? It's the same thing with, with, with like your, like, like your example with jokes, right? It's like, yeah, it's like, you know, timing or, you know, maybe the prosody or your speech and maybe it's the narrative format. Maybe it's the, you know, whatever, you know, but again, I mean, there's, you can't get it down to a formula because you, ostensibly, right? If you did, then you could just replicate that, but there's something, there's something else there it's not just formulaic uh i mean there's pieces of that right because like for example let's say you sp spelled out all of Chappelle's like formula of how he does things you can't just go and replicate that right there's something there no yeah totally the, the, and a lot of people kind of misunderstand this point they uh, in fact a lot of people in the pickup artist community kind of misinterpreted this they thought oh if we can just come up with the magical formula of how to imitate other guys who are highly behaviorally attractive. Mm -hmm. We can just like do the same thing and then become behaviorally attractive. The trouble is if this stuff was easy to imitate, if it was easy to learn, it would not be a good, reliable fitness indicator mm -hmm. that gives you, you know, hard to fake information about the person. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the fact that it's, you know, let's take stand-up comedian Anthony Jesselnik, who mm -hmm. violates taboos all over the place and makes a lot of dead baby jokes. Yes, he does. Okay. If someone who's not actually smart and funny tries to make dead baby jokes on a first date, it's probably not going to go very well. Might be the last date. Right? <laughs> so you, you, you almost have to have a kind of Anthony Jesselnik level of comic genius to make mm -hmm. it work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could also, is it the timing, the prosody, the, the delivery, who knows? But, like, if you took everything I'm saying in this podcast and asked, like, Jesselnik or Bill Burr or Chappelle, make it funny, they could probably do that. Like, mm -hmm. they could probably deliver it in a way that w would have you in stitches and rolling around on the mm -hmm. floor and thinking that's mm -hmm. hilarious. Even if they were talking about, like, mathematical models of sexual selection. Mm-hmm. So long story short, the, the important thing is that these sort of behavioral uh, fitness indicators that are sexually attractive, it's, it's important that it be pretty hard for like teenagers or less capable people or you know, novices, pretty hard for them to imitate it. Mm. Right? Anything that you can imitate easily is not going to be a reliable indicator and therefore probably won't be very attractive hmm. is there and on that piece of it is there something about it that's um that there's like a that there's um is there like an individuality to it is that what it is like it's something about that person's temperament their personality their individuality that's that's giving it kind of the you know social capital if you will or 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 what can we say about that i think there's some there's something going on there and i don't exactly understand what it is mm -hmm. um if you look at like the recruitment of um models into like ford modeling agency sure yeah. they're not just looking for like world-class beauty they are looking for that but they're also looking for distinctiveness mm -hmm. somebody with a really unusual face where it's almost right on the edge of being uh superhuman or non-human mm -hmm. where you're like wow i guess that's a direction that future human evolution <laughs> could go in that could produce that kind of face right but here it is in the present like how did that happen mm -hmm. and i think likewise um comic genius musical genius artistic genius often has this kind of uh extremely attractive distinctiveness and individuality and i'm honestly not quite sure yet why we value that mm -hmm. uh, i mean part of it might be okay if you're really distinctive and it's really good that's a sign that it's really from you and you're not just imitating somebody else mm -hmm. okay 
um, part of it might be you've figured out um, how to construct a niche mm. for yourself that's mm -hmm. distinctive, which also means you understand everything else going around you socially, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you're like a real musician's musician who's widely respected by other musicians, yeah. why do they respect you? It's because you're not just repeating mm -hmm. you know, some formulaic approach to melody, rhythm, timbre, et cetera. You're really doing something uh, special. Yeah. And then the fangirls or the fanboys, right, who get, um, you know, who follow music critics or pay attention to what do other musicians really think of musician X that they're trying to evaluate, you know, they will clue into that distinctiveness and go, okay, you know, this person's not just a genius, not just a great performer, but also uh, a great creative songwriter. And they're doing something new and different. And that is, you know, quite a bit harder than just repeating something somebody else has done, even if, even if you have like perfect virtuosity and perfect delivery. Mm. So, right. There's, so, still, there's still a mystery there, and I don't quite understand yeah, it. And, yeah, and it is fascinating. Yeah, it, it is because. I don't know if you can put it in a box of sorts, right? Of like, I'll stick with music for a minute. So like, you know, when you, when you, when you see a, when you see a, a group or a band such as King Crimson, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, they're a musician's band. Like people go nuts. Like, you know, people of all generations, when they came out in 68, 69, and all the way up till today, even young people, when you just, when you, when you introduce them to that, I mean, you, their mind gets blown and you, you get it. So you could be totally musical and you'll be like, oh God, yeah, those guys are amazing. Or you could have no sense of music and still get, even if it's a different preference or an affinity, still get it. Like you get it. And aside from the, wow, you know, the awe or the admiration or the respect. There's something that it's saying, right? There is a signal that's being displayed here, right? Whether, you know, uh, you know, Robert Fripp is just a genius and, you know, okay. Um, you could, you could do this. I mean, people say this about, um, you know, you know, Igmar Bergman. I mean, he's a genius. He's a genius, right? He's an absolute genius. And. I don't know. I, I mean, there is the mystery to it because when, you, when you see when you sit down and you see this, and other humans see this with other humans, you say, well, why, why, why do we care about this? What is it saying? What is it signaling? And I don't know. I'm, I'm with you on this. I don't know if we have all the answers or something. I like the first part of what you said, where it's like this person is kind of is is taking the the inputs from their environment and they're curating it in their own mind in a way, and then they're putting it out you know, that's, you know, special. I mean, you, you, you couldn't recreate that. There's, there's too much individuality or maybe it's like, um, mm, I wonder if it's like a kind of, uh, like a sacred notion almost like this is so unique. You know, we, we're, we're never going to have that again. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, but it is, there is something there that's not quite, we can't like kind of pin down or whatever. I don't know. What do you think? Well, you know, it is an extraordinary thing about humans that some of our creative and kind of computational and cognitive abilities uh, certainly would look really supernatural. If, if, like, if a chimpanzee yeah. could interview us with any level of language at all and then could, like, really understand what's going on with King Crimson or with, you know, Maria Bamford's comedy or whatever, right. they would think we are godlike in our, mm -hmm. in our creative powers. Mm-hmm. And compared to them, we kind of are. And that's, I think, you know, at least partly due to, to this mutual mate choice sexual selection thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something to be celebrated and I something agree. most of us take for granted. And I think, um, you know, I have clinical psychology colleagues who do a lot of like couples therapy and marital therapy. And I think mm -hmm. if, if more people in long-term relationships had this kind of evolutionary psych perspective on each other mm -hmm. and their awesome abilities for 
language and humor and 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 competence that we that we take for granted you know maybe those relationships would be just a little bit happier and a little more uh, full of gratitude and appreciation and and uh even awe sometimes mm -hmm. I, I firmly agree. It reminds me of the the bit that you were saying earlier about mate retention, which is, I think, maybe, well, I'll say this, uh, maybe, maybe you can tell me what you think, but I think mate retention is much harder in a uh, mon monogamous relationship than mate uh, choice or selection at the beginning, <laughs> because you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep it. There's a, there's a kind of stamina there of sorts of, of trying to, you know, keep this person interested in, in some ways. And I think to that point of what you're saying is, is, is very true. Um, how do I say this? Like, um, I think with, with mates, if you have a long-term mate or whatever, in a, at least in a monogamous context, trying to, I mean, being impressed by your mate continuously, I think is important for the health of the relationship. Um, I don't know. I don't want to say if it's essential, but I think it's really important and what that can look like. So, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I think maybe, I don't know. My, my wife is probably impressed with, with some of the things I do or, um, and and, and I definitely am for her. I mean, she's supremely talented and she's a, she's a great artist. And so it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, how are we still after a long time saying, Hey, like you're, you're doing something, you're creating something, whether it's whatever, whatever the medium is, the medium is almost irrelevant in some ways. Um, whatever the medium is, you know, I, I guess to me that would signal something of like, um, mm, it's it's definitely something about the person trying to to create something but to that there's something like a there's a very active thing going on for them right that their their life isn't dependent on other things or people or or the relationship but that there's a there's an aliveness to to them continuously which i think is important for um fostering um, uh, important and healthy relationships and then how you have experiences how you make decisions and with certain problems all of these things and so i think that those aspects of this kind of you know ornamental mind as we've been talking about are are really important for mate retention and so I, I don't know if the aesthetic or the creative or whatever would you would say is important for for mate retention there yeah, th this is another key point I think a lot of people kind of missed if they read Mating Mind too, too quickly or superficially or whatever, that mm -hmm. I put a lot of emphasis on the importance of mating effort continuing even after the relationship forms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in an ideal long-term relationship, you keep up enough mating effort with your girlfriend, boyfriend, spouse that they stay, you know, interested in you, attracted to you, willing to keep having kids with you. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of modern marriages, people kind of get lazy and they do like the minimum mm -hmm. necessary mating effort or even less than that. Right. They get into a so-called dead bedroom situation where they're not having sex very much. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, remember from evolution's point of view, from evolution's point of view, uh, the difference between having uh, one kid and two kids is just as big as the difference between zero and one kid, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of the mate choice within marriages might be in those crucial times where like you've already got one baby and you're deciding, okay, <laughs> can we face having a second baby? Mm -hmm. Can we face having a third baby? Mm -hmm. I don't know what the hell was going on with my grandparents who had 12 kids. Uh, yes, but apparently, yes, I, I can't imagine. You know, <laughs> apparently the mating effort was good enough or their outside options in terms of leaving were, were bad enough that uh, <laughs> right. they kept it up. Um, so yeah, the, the problem is, you know, Hollywood romantic comedies portray the marriage ceremony itself as the end of courtship, the end of mating effort, and as if everything after that is just sort of uh, cruising along yeah. without any effort, yeah. as if yeah. that's easy. And then contemporary adult dramas all portray marriages as full of stupid, pointless, avoidable conflict, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what screenwriters love to deliver, conflict. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you don't actually see that many uh, media role models of people in happy marriages who are actually continuing to make good mating efforts towards each other. Mm -hmm. Because to outside observers, maybe that's not actually very interesting. Yeah. Um, but within the marriage, that's, that's the whole ball game. That's how you get, you right. know, five kids instead of just one kid. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I, I agree. I think there's a, it, it's under, it's underrated. <laughs> it's, it's less, it's not talked about as much. And yeah, you definitely do mention it, um, in, in the mating mind. Um, I guess I, I, before I switch to this other topic, so in the book, you talk about, um, all of these things, the runaway process, fitness indicators, and then the sensory biases. I guess we've been talking about that and, and how they work with sexual ornamentation, both you know physically and then in the mind. I guess how does all of those things work together in tandem, right? So obviously people will just take one of those and just you know talk about it or use it. How do we, you know, you kind of have like a kind of integrative approach I, I see in, in the book of how do we how do we have it all? How do we have all of these things to kind of there are pieces that try and help us understand um, both sexual ornaments uh, physically and, and mentally. Honestly, I, you know, after 20, 22 years after that thing was published, I still mm -hmm. don't fully understand how it all goes together. Mm -hmm. And partly that's because like, it's kind of not fully my job. Like I'm not a full-time biology professor who's doing sexual selection theory. Sure. So those those guys are still kind of working on this stuff. How do you integrate, you know, uh, Michael Ryan's concept of sensory bias with Amat Zahavi's concept of the handicap principle with, mm -hmm. you know, evolutionary game theory approaches to how how this plays out. Um, but I guess I would just emphasize that I think a lot of what's going on with human mate choice is just focused on which heritable traits that could be passed on to my offspring are perceivable by me, are informative, you know, add new information to what I already know. Mm -hmm. And those are the things worth paying attention to. And those are the things that kind of get compiled into uh, being perceived as attractive. Mm. Right. So I think sexual attractiveness means you're focused on information that is like distinctive and informative and actionable mm. in terms of guiding, you know, who do I want to combine my genes with? Right. Mm. So, um, <laughs> people do this with, uh, with one person, but some people, um, in times past and in, in, in certain, uh, uh, places today and, and even in the quote unquote Western world, people have polyamorous relationships, right? So <clears throat> now I, I'm a little curious. So, I mean, I know that you and, and others were kind of the, you know, you're the, the polyamory guy for a while, right? And <laughs> I know you don't talk about it maybe as much or as you did, but I guess, tell me, tell me how, just give me the overview of, of polyamory, but really in today's world. So there's a, plenty of things to ask about but is that feasible is it tenable what do we do with jealousy what about the moral aspect how, how could we how does it work in a way and how do we understand it from an evolutionary perspective in a, in a modern age i guess yeah it's it's a big complicated topic um it's a heavily stigmatized topic yes. right yes. the yes. amount of you know social prejudice and mockery and derogation of people in open relationships, swingers, polyamorous relationships, et cetera. It's you really never intense. got any of that. You got none of that. You? you never got that stuff. You never got that. <laughs> I, yeah, I've gotten my, more than my fair share. Um, I mean, the, the key uh, insight there, I guess, is, look, you can, you can form friendships, alliances, social bonds with people in, in lots of different ways. And in many societies, um, what you're supposed to do is have a sexually exclusive, very long-term relationship with a primary mate, and you're supposed to form all your other social 
uh, relationships and collaborations and exchange relationships and, and business relationships without using sexual attraction or sexual interaction. Mm-hmm. I think polyamory is saying, well, hang on, wait a minute, maybe um, there are responsible, moral, legitimate ways to have social networks that do include some sexual interaction with other people, you know, even outside a primary pair bond, mm-hmm. um, in ways that are, uh, A, fun and fulfilling, and B, uh, ethical and responsible and open and honest. Yeah. So, it's an experiment. This is a grand experiment. Um, people will say, oh, polyamory is the same old stuff, same old casual sex, same old polygyny. No, it really isn't. It's really quite a new cultural invention that originated in, in the 90s. Traditional polygyny, right, where you have like an alpha male, like a despot, a high status dominant guy whose wealth and power means he has a little harem or a big harem. Mm-hmm. That's not polyamory because that guy is not happy if his, quote, his women, mm-hmm. you know, go off and have relations with other men. Right. Right. So there, there's an extreme asymmetry between the sexes in that kind of traditional polygyny. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's also what we see in lots of other mammal species. Um, polyamory is also interesting to evolutionary psychologists because it deliberately, you know, consciously tries to overcome our sexual jealousy instincts. Yeah. So they're kind of trying to, to take sexual jealousy and hack it, neutralize it, or eroticize it, or deal with it somehow in a way that makes it possible to have these sort of parallel relationships with with other people. Now, there's lots of human emotions, Mm -hmm. right? Like aggressive anger, where everybody, as they're a teenager, well, from being a toddler through being a teenager to being an adult, you are expected to master your aggressive anger so that you do not go around getting into fights with everybody. Right so that you can control it, sublimate it, manage it, be mature and responsible about it. Mm -hmm. Um, Likewise with, let's say, uh, resource envy. If you see somebody else who's got a lot more money or a bigger house or nicer clothes or a cooler car or, you know, a yacht, you're supposed to manage that, learn to, you know, deal with it, suppress it, you know, Mm -hmm. be able to go to work for a boss who makes more than you do without getting into arguments all the time with them. Mm-hmm. So for almost every, every evolved emotion that we have, you know, mature functioning adults are, are expected to be able to master those emotions and deal with them. Mm-hmm. Jealousy seems to be the one exception where everybody treats it like, there's no possible way, dude, I could ever master my sexual jealousy or emotional jealousy. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just a given. It's completely beyond control. It dominates my life. Um, and that's legit that, you know, being a real alpha male means you're being dominated by your own jealousy. And that's legit mm-hmm. to a lot of guys mm-hmm. and, and a lot of women. Yeah. Um, so when I teach my course on alternative relationships, when I do research on polyamory, we've got a big consortium looking at poly open and, and monogamous relationships. Um, partly it's fascinating to me because it's this, uh, subculture of people trying to master an emotion, jealousy, uh, which clearly is evolved, does have important adaptive functions, and that most people think they can't master. Mm-hmm. So how do they do it? That, that's, you know, um, I think quite intellectually interesting to me. So I guess the question here is, so I'll come back to jealousy, but I feel like people, many people will say, well, no, 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 it's not the jealousy piece. I mean, yeah, a little bit, but it's the commitment, right? You know, it's the commitment, right? If you're with somebody else sexually and you're giving and emotionally, like you're giving part of yourself to this person actually, right? You know, physically, but then also emotionally. Well, how can you give that to me too? And if there's other people involved as well, but let's, let's just say it's, you know, both people have somebody else. 
right? So there's, I guess, four players in, in the, or four, four subjects or whatever in, in this scenario. You know, how, how can you do that? You're like, you're not committed. Committed is exclusive is, is, is usually, I think, how people think of it. And then, yeah, there is all the jealousy stuff. Like, well, is that person, you know, better in bed than I am? Are they more attentive to your feelings than I am? Are they? So there's all those things too that can really spawn some pretty serious other, you know, anger and rage and all these things. So I guess my question here is about the commitment in a, in a poly or open kind of dynamic. How do you, how do we, navigate the commitment thing, I guess, because I think that's really what people are getting at a lot of times. Yeah, I should, I should say, I think c commitment is really important. It's absolutely crucial if you're doing long-term relationship and you're, you're going to have kids, like you need to have a high degree of commitment. And, you know, you can go into a relationship with a high degree of commitment and things can still go wrong and people can get divorced and break up mm -hmm. and whatever. Sure. Um, but to me, it's very, very funny that you know, culture tells people um, sexual commitment implies absolutely sexual exclusivity. Yes. Well, there are very few other domains of life where people will say, oh, you're, o you're only really committed if you're exclusive. Mm -hmm. Like if you were like complaining to me, well, you're doing my co podcast, but you're going to do <laughs> Michaela Peterson's podcast on Friday. And so... <laughs> this means nothing. This, this podcast relationship is a sham and you're, you're cheating on me with, with other podcasts or like when I get into arguments on, on Twitter with uh, the Bitcoin maximalists, the crypto bros, and they're like, you don't really believe in Bitcoin Miller. Cause you, you, you know, forming dalliances with these other shit coins like Cardano and Algorand and like, how dare you? Cause Commitment to Bitcoin is exclusive, and you're not allowed to invest in anything else. I think, come on. Um, or, you know, if we, my wife and I have been digital nomads for the last couple of years. We move around to different cities. We've lived in Brooklyn. We've lived in Austin. We happen to live in Albuquerque at the moment. It would be like if Austin, Texas was like, how dare you move to Brooklyn even for a couple of months? Where's your commitment to Austin? It's like, Right. We love you, Austin. We also love New York. So mm -hmm. I think when evaluating this, you have, to, you have to break it down and go, okay, what exact role is sexual exclusivity playing mm -hmm. in terms of commitment? Mm -hmm. Granted, for a lot of people, if they can't master their jealousy, if they can't handle multiple open and honest relationships with others, if they have tendencies to lie and cheat, Mm -hmm. then maybe exclusivity is a good strategic um, way to maintain a long-term commitment. Right. <clears throat> I'm just saying that's not necessarily a strategy that will work for everybody or that should necessarily be imposed on everybody. So I guess, how does it, how does it, how does it work then? Right? Like if you have a poly, I mean, again, I'm, I'm sure there's variants here. Everyone's different and things like that, but you know, does it have to be, you know, let me just say there's a there's a uh you know a straight couple <clears throat> man and woman and they does it have to be both people are you know very honest and saying i'm with this other person and or you don't say that does both people need to have that at the same time or does it have to be i guess i could think of so many ways in like maybe the specifics of where this would break down i guess or or get complicated you know what about if you have kids and then how do you explain that? How does that work? How, how does, how do, how do we, how do we see a, uh, in, in your, in your way of seeing this, how would a, a polyamorous relationship look like? Um, I don't want to say ideally, but in a, in a healthy way or, or in a, yeah, as, as, as best you can in a respectful, healthy way. There's, there's a bunch of different ways to do it that I think uh, work that are kind of time tested and, and that seem to have been successful for millions of people. Mm -hmm. And then there's other ways to try it that I really think can't work and make no sense. Mm -hmm. So here's a, here's a way that makes no sense to me that I don't think works very often. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a method of doing polyamory called relationship anarchy, RA. Okay. The concept here is you meet people, you interact with them, maybe you have sex, maybe you don't. You never define what the relationship is. 
you don't have any clear expectations about the future. You don't have form any commitments. You just kind of let things develop however they're, they're going to develop. You don't have any possessiveness or protectiveness about the relationship. And, uh, you know, if you're a long-term pair bond partner says, well, oh, actually, I'm falling for this other person. I'm going to move out and be with them now. You're supposed to say, good for you, because that means they're a better fit for you than I was. I think that is delusional, toxic, <laughs> stupid, can't work. Right. <clears throat> is a real disservice to any, you know, family and kids involved. Sure, yeah. Uh, or any, uh, you know, bank you owe your mortgage to or whatever. <laughs> right. So right. Um, I'm, a, I'm a believer in a form of polyamory called hierarchical polyamory, which means you explicitly say, some relationships are much more important to me than other relationships. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. might have a primary relationship, which would typically be like your pair bonded partner, your, your married spouse, whatever, the person probably you live with, have kids with, etc. Mm -hmm. Then you have some secondary relationships. You see people once in a while, mm -hmm. but you're open with them and you're honest and you're like, my primary partner is a more important relationship to me than you are. Mm -hmm. And you might have somebody else who's more important to you than I am. And that's okay, mm -hmm. right? And then you might have comets, people you see like once in a while, when they come to town, once, twice a year, whatever. You might have, you know, occasional short-term things. But the ethical ideal is with, that with all the people you interact with, you're open and honest about what are your current relationships that you're in? What do they mean to you? What level of commitment do they entail? Um, what are the kind of rules and expectations that you've negotiated with them? Um, and I think that uh, works better for a lot of people than, let's say, relationship anarchy. Um, and then you've got the swingers. We're not swingers, but there's a lot of married couples who have been swingers since the 70s, mm -hmm. in fact, since the 50s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they have a different way of managing this. Typically, they have a strong primary pair bond that is absolutely paramount, but they crave some variety. So they'll go to a swingers club, a swingers hotel, a swingers cruise ship. They'll meet other couples. Mm -hmm. And then typically the two couples will interact sexually, mm -hmm. but with a clear understanding that they're not going to leave their spouse. Mm -hmm. They're not going to swap, you know, switch for the long term. Typically mm -hmm. they already have, you know, kids who are left at home with the grandparents or the babysitter or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, that seems to be a fairly stable way to do it also, because what you're doing is you're kind of minimizing uh, the risk that either spouse really falls in love mm -hmm. with somebody else and forms a deep emotional attachment to them. Mm -hmm. So swingers have a kind of different way of managing jealousy than uh, polyamorous people. So the hierarchical one is interesting to me, I guess, because what happens, so it sounds like there's a, there's just a very, is a very, in terms of the ethics of it, of trying to just be very honest at the forefront, right? With all parties, but predominantly with your, <clears throat> with everybody, yes, but to that, that there's a, there's a buy-in or there's an agreement or there's a convergence with, you know, you and your mate and vice versa. But and even if you tell other people in terms of the hierarchy as as this goes a few questions here i guess the one question is is what happens if if that evolves or that changes right so let's say you have your spouse let's say in the scenario and you say listen you do the whole thing everyone agrees okay yes that makes sense yeah of course fine and you have somebody that you see occasionally and you have you know you get a lot out of the relationship but it's clear from the outset that <laughs> relationally in this dynamic you're less important than my <laughs> long-term mate but there's so many value valuable things here etc cetera, etc cetera. but what if that evolves right as you know things aren't static relationships aren't static they're dynamic right so they're as you you know are physical with them you spend time you do things that may evolve into something. And then doesn't that get 
complicated or potentially could get complicated. And if it does on either side, so let's say for yourself, but maybe not for yourself, maybe the other person, right? They, they've fully agreed, but they, you know, they did, they, you know, feelings arise or there's an attraction or some type of intimacy or connection or whatever that they want more. Or it's very difficult. I guess, how, how do you troubleshoot some of those things? I guess. Yeah, I think there's, there's sort of two different ways that the situation get, can get complicated. One way is, you know, very often if somebody starts seeing a new person, you get so-called new relationship energy, NRE, or, you know, or normies call it infatuation, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Sort of falling for somebody. Right. Um, experienced polyamorists know that that is usually transient and not to be taken too seriously. Right? Mm-hmm. They know, uh, yeah, I see somebody new, I will experience NRE, but does it mean I should leave my spouse? No, mm-hmm. no. And the more times you've kind of gone through that, you, you have the NRE and then it fades, you have mm-hmm. it with somebody else and then it fades, you stay with your spouse. You know, the more times you have that or the more times you see your spouse having it, Mm-hmm. The more confident you can be, it's not an existential risk to the relationship. Mm-hmm. It's just a thing that happens. It's just like if your spouse gets a new enthusiasm doing puzzles or gardening or you know, watching some reality TV show. It's not necessarily a threat. They're not necessarily going to just keep escalating that forever. Mm-hmm. So they're just watching the reality TV show right. 24-7. Right. Right. So... That's one thing that can happen is you, you, you learn not to take the infatuations too seriously. Mm. The other thing that can happen is you might actually meet somebody who in some ways is a better fit or a legit contender. Mm. You know, maybe they would have made a better long-term mate for you than your current spouse mm. mm-hmm. um, if you'd met them first, mm. right? Um, that's never happened to me yet with, you know, my wife, Diana, nobody else comes close in terms of being a good fit to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the way to, to handle that is number one, make sure your initial mate choice of your long-term partner is really, really strong and that you are a distinctive fit to them. Mm-hmm. Now, if you've got two kind of unusual people like me and my wife who have very strange interests and, enthusiasms and both into this evolutionary psychology thing and like you know both care about animal welfare and animal suffering blah blah like if you go down a list of sort of bizarre matches um Mm -hmm. it's extremely unlikely statistically that i would ever meet anybody who's like a better match to me Yeah, yeah yeah but for a lot of people out there where they kind of end up with a mate who isn't actually that distinctive a match to them. Mm-hmm. This could be a real problem, and I would not necessarily recommend polyamory to those people. Sure, yeah. You know, so, don't open up your your relationship if you're not pretty confident that you're a really good match to your your spouse, because you could easily meet someone who's a better match. Yeah, it's like there. It's like there's a kind of black box of sorts with the with the mate, the the primary one. It's it's like, look, you know, you're you're just untouchable, right? Like no one competes with you. Like it's just there's just different rules. It just doesn't, you know, not like in a kind of you know sappy, romanticized kind of like legitimately, like legitimately, like you just. I mean, maybe yes, there is a you know two percent chance or something that could happen, but it's highly unlikely. It's highly, highly, highly unlikely. And then I would imagine also if you have time with that person and experiences, you know, that falls into the thing. So, you know, but I guess the, the one piece of this here is, well, and this is something I'm, I'm curious about. You know, someone could listen to this, or I'm sure people are listening to this and be like, ah, oh, man, this fucking guy, Jeffrey, man, like he just, he just wants his cake and eat it too. He just wants to, you know, be with other, other ladies and he wants his, you know, uh, his wife at home, like what in the world? Like, I guess the, the question is what's, I guess the point or the intention in this setup. So I think you're right. I think obviously this is not for everybody or this isn't, you know, or people have to be very considerate about this and ethical and respectful, but let's say all that's there. 
what's the significance of this or why do this or what are you getting out of it or what's the intention here for for doing this kind of stuff i mean partly it keeps you young partly it keeps you <laughs> motivated partly it's a way of of making sure that your you know your your mating effort stays sharp mm. and that does actually generalize across relationships so if i'm motivated to like stay in good physical shape or stay sharp and like actually read a nonfiction book once in a while, or not just to veg out and and you know watch action movies or football or something. Mm -hmm. um, that actually brings benefits to my primary relationship. Mm -hmm. So partly you're hacking the psychology of mating effort, kind of in the service of your main pair bond. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in a lot of marriages do get very lazy. Yeah. Right. They get the dad bod. They get um, mm -hmm. boring. They stop making efforts. They stop dressing, you know, a, a, attractively. And then if the if the couple goes out to a party, to a dinner party, to some social event, they realize, oh man, this is this is not the man I married. This is not the woman I married. They have become dull. Mm -hmm. um, this, of course, can particularly happen if you've got. Uh, a demanding career if you've got sure. kids mm -hmm. if you've you know got other other drains on your time so partly it's that um partly it's just making life more interesting and being able to meet and interact with people who uh, might not have been good primary partners but who are still really interesting people to meet and to get to know right so yeah, so that's my so that's my that's my kind of where I was going with this. <clears throat> I don't know if you if, how you feel about this. I I don't I, I don't I don't know how I feel about it. I just it's something that I've thought about. You know, not necessarily for me personally, just in general. About you know, you have a, you have a you have a mate, so life you know, a long uh, pair bonded mate. You're in a committed monogamous relationship, etc. There's never one person that's going to meet a hundred percent of your needs, and I don't necessarily think that you have to. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's a the is ought thing or whatever. But um, you know, let's say it's seventy percent, right? You know, checks all the boxes, right, on many important, very important things: worldview, um, how you raise kids, what you're doing for your own life and career all the the essential things right and that spreadsheet right <laughs> right all the big things and and let's say let's say you have this 30 percent that can still have you know some of the creativity piece the 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 adventurous piece the you know or, or other things it doesn't have to all be these kind of you know sexy romanticized features of yourself but and let's say for whatever reason and again, nothing about your partner. I mean, they could be amazing. They're just their personal capacity just doesn't do that. And vice versa, right? You know, you're not doing that for them, right? You can play with the numbers, 80, 20, 70, 30, 60, 40, whatever it is. Would in your hierarchical, you know, poly kind of dynamic, would that be kind of the idea of listen? you know, there's 30%. I don't even want to say it like this, but you know, you're just not going to cut it. Right. It's just, that's just, you know, it's not your fault. It's not my fault. It just is. And I don't need it, but I'd like to explore it. And this person is less important to me in terms of a, a kind of committed relationship, but they meet this one need or this, you know, whatever. And again, I'm not saying need like, you know, are you really into BDSM and this one person? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but you know, I, I'm saying it could be like a, you know, an affinity, an interest. Uh, you know, yeah, maybe some physical components. It could be a, a, a hobby or interest. You know, that's particular, et cetera, right? Or an emotional need. Is, is it kind of work that way too? Where it would say, yeah, yeah, why not? Um, is it something along those lines, or or no? Oh yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> You know, a, a lot of poly people I know, you know, if they got the, their primary mate, and if they're in a high-functioning poly relationship, then they know exactly which parts of themselves they can successfully share with their mate and where their interests actually overlap. Mm 
And they don't have to try to force each other mm-hmm. to share all of their interests, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. One of the great frustrations in a lot of marriages is, you know, the guy's off interested in something, whatever it is, the history of, you know, military aviation, tries to get his wife interested in this. She's like, I don't care. This is not, not <laughs> something I'm passionate about. Mm-hmm. And um, she'll kind of invalidate it even, like discourage uh-huh. this interest. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if he's poly, he's, um, you know, potentially open to, to going to one of the tens of millions of women fascinated by history of military aviation <laughs> and find a secondary partner who's into that. <laughs> but more seriously, you know, there's, let's say you have um, a primary Mary mate and like two or three secondary mates you see once in a while who have like different careers, different mm-hmm. passions and interests. Mm-hmm. Um, there are things you can learn about a different interest or a different career by having a sexual relationship with someone mm-hmm. that you can't learn about as smoothly or easily or deeply if you just have a non-sexual friendship with them. How? How does that work? Um, Partly it's just pillow talk. It's partly like sex helps you lower your defenses so that you're more open-minded and you can, you can learn about stuff. Mm-hmm. Partly it's mating effort. Like mm-hmm. if they're like, this, is, this has been a great second date. Um, on the third date, I hope to tell you more about whatever my uh, career in Hollywood set design. Then you might actually be motivated to read a book about that so that you can talk about it with your, mm-hmm. your your new lover in a way that if they were like a non-sexual male friend you might be like okay bro let's talk about it but i didn't do any homework i haven't <laughs> bothered to learn about it it's, you know, like that would be weird right. you know <laughs> um so partly it's a motivational effect um and partly it's just just a kind of um it's kind of intimacy and empathy effect mm-hmm. for example um, let's say you have a lover with significantly different political views sure. than you do. You're going to be a little more motivated to actually like get inside their head and see their point of view and like, mm-hmm. oh, uh, gosh, now I can see why you actually voted for whatever, Biden or Trump or mm-hmm. Rand Paul or whatever, mm-hmm. in a way that you might not bother to do if they were just a non-sexual friend. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, the, a, a lot of the poly people I know are kind of more um, politically centrist in a way because they need to be able to deal mm-hmm. with, um, you know, uh, sexual partners who are kind of all over the map in terms of their, their politics or their religion or their ideology in general. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is the way to overcome bipartisan <laughs> <politics>. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so fascinating. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I've, I've read a lot of things about um, uh, polyamory and, and it's always, it's just something that's an interesting thing, I think, because of, for me, it's interesting because of where our evolutionary history has been um, and how we do it now. And I don't put a, a moral valence on this stuff. I mean, I, I mean, I think there's probably pros and cons of both. I think there's there is a moral aspect and ethical aspect to it. But you're right. I do think that there is a. I mean, there is a uh, definitely a stigma, a taboo of sorts. And and you know, again, I don't, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but it it, it is a thing. Um, and so it's interesting to to hear sort of from an evolutionary lens, and then how it looks pragmatically in, in the modern world. Um, of how of how it works um okay so let's uh, two two uh two other big topics here so we'll shift away from the book now and and, and more recent stuff so a few things here so let's let's talk about um some of your work that you've been doing recently on uh ai um and so I, I know that there's some connection here with the effective altruism movement. Uh, so just kind of generally for people that don't know what that is, just kind of describe what effective altruism is and then how that's kind of connected here with trying to understand um, alignment 
with artificial intelligence and what that's like and all that. Yeah. Effective altruism in general is a kind of ethical, uh, social, practical movement that now involves tens of thousands of people around the world. The basic idea is you try to use reason and evidence and open discussion to figure out um, if we're going to try to do good in the world, good for other people or animals or societies, um, what's the most effective way to do that? Mm -hmm. Let's actually be kind of scientific and systematic about it. Mm -hmm. It originated in trying to evaluate charities. Like if you're going to give a bunch of money to a charity, how do you evaluate whether they're actually doing any good with it or whether they're just kind of a parasitic nonprofit that takes your money and then doesn't actually deliver any, any benefits for anybody. Mm -hmm. So way back about uh, 15 years ago, when organizations like GiveWell, mm -hmm. um, which is founded by two hedge fund guys, they started to you know, challenge charities. They were like, show us your quantitative data about you know, how many lives are you actually saving with your intervention? Does it work? Have you done randomized controlled trials? Mm -hmm. Have you um, really checked that you're doing anything useful other than just the nonprofit itself existing? Mm -hmm. And they found, lo and behold, the vast majority of charities have no metrics of success. They do not evaluate impact. They do, have not done randomized controlled trials. Mm -hmm. They have no idea how much good they're doing or not doing. And to a certain kind of, you know, scientifically minded person, that's outrageous. They're spending yeah. hundreds of billions of dollars of charity contributions a year, and they have no idea, you know, what, what good, if any, it's doing. So effective altruism really has roots in evaluating uh, charities and trying to figure out what, you know, if you're going to give money, where should you give it? And they kind of settled pretty quickly on, oh, you know, some low-hanging fruit is global public health. Basically, reduce parasite load in poor countries. Yeah. Uh, get rid of intestinal parasites. Fight mm -hmm. malaria with malaria bed nets. Um, do immunization programs in South Asia and Africa. Mm -hmm. And they figured out, wow, you can, you know, often save a life for like a few hundred or a couple thousand dollars um, there in a way that would have cost a lot more to save in, you know, the rich countries. If you're just like donating to, um, you know, cancer charities that may or may not ever actually cure cancer. Are you saying that when I give the, uh, when I round up my, my total at the CVS for whatever uh, <laughs> foundation, it's not going anywhere. Is it just going in the trash, Jeffrey? Damn it. It's going somewhere. It's helping pay the salaries of the people right, running right. those nonprofits, right? <laughs> and that's right. fine. Right. But it's um, the stigma, though. If you say you select no and everyone's watching you, you don't care about St. Jude's Hospital or whatever it is. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, in, in a way, you know, effective altruism was uh, trying to be the exact opposite of the kind of warm glow virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. They were saying, oh, you give to charity. Good for you. Uh, you get a warm glow. That's great. You can virtue signal to all your rich buddies. I'm so generous. I'm giving, you know, mm -hmm. X percent. Of that's, that's fine. But is, are you actually doing anything? Yeah. Um, you know, part of the motivation for me um, doing my little virtue signaling book mm -hmm. was to kind of contrast that mindset where, like, I'm a good person because I'm giving to charity with the effective altruism mindset of, Okay, show me the proof. Show me the proof you're actually, your, your money is actually doing anything that helps mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very realist, pragmatic, scientific, skeptical approach mm -hmm. to charity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where does this fit in with AI and the alignment problem? And so, so tell, I mean, you can define AI if you want. I mean, I know people kind of fight about that, but, um, but. <clears throat> and what is this alignment thing with AI? Yeah. So as, as effective altruism developed as a movement over the last 10 years, um, people gradually realized like it's great to reduce malaria. It's great to do direct cash transfers to the poor. That helps people in the present. It's great to fight factory farming and reduce the suffering of the chickens and the pigs. That's mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. 
in the present, but there's also the future. Right. There's also risks that humanity faces, um, big risks from you know, nuclear war, from uh, global pandemics, and potentially from technological innovations mm -hmm. uh, like artificial intelligence could be potentially quite dangerous. So people kind of shifted into this long-termist mentality, thinking about the long-term, you know, future years and decades and future generations. Mm -hmm. um, Will McGaskill, you know, just published this book a couple months ago called What We Owe the Future. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is about the very, very long-term future, you know, that there could be future trillions of humans and post-humans and we can spread throughout the galaxy and it's important not to, to fuck that up and to make sure we can potentially do that if we want. Um, but actually, it's, it's more, you know, I'm kind of more concerned about the fact that within my lifetime or you're a bit younger than me, your lifetime or my, my children's lifetimes, mm -hmm that some of these other existential risks like the nuclear war or the bad AI could actually mess things up, you know, soon. And mm -hmm. given the current like tensions with Russia over Ukraine, for example, mm -hmm. or potential tensions with China over South China Sea, you know, mm -hmm. nuclear war is again, a live possibility and mm -hmm. something to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, I had some great conversations um, with Daniel Ellsberg, uh, who wrote a great book called uh, The Doomsday Machine. Ellsberg was an old uh, RAND Corporation nuclear strategist back in the 60s, and he's still alive. He's like 90. Yeah. And uh, he's like, nuclear war could still happen. It could still be really bad. It could still cause nuclear winter, and people are neglecting it as, as an issue. Hmm. Um, if anything is likely to kill my kids, you know, within my lifetime, it's it's a nuclear war. It could still mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then potentially harmful artificial intelligence might still be a, a ways away, but it's also potentially a, a big uh, global catastrophic risk in several ways. Mm -hmm. uh, some of which have been covered pretty well in science fiction movies, mm -hmm. you know, more or less implausibly, but, mm -hmm. you know, from the Terminator to Ex Machina to her to um, uh, Blade Runner, you know, there's lots to, to Black Mirror, mm -hmm. the TV series. There's mm -hmm. lots of possibilities for AI going very badly wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got interested in kind of coming back to that as an issue where potentially psychology could be helpful. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, is, this, is this what you're meaning by the alignment issue? Right. So how do we how do we understand our these existential risks where how they're connected with the AI that we're producing now and then potentially in, in the near future and then the more distant future is how do we what is that relationship between humans and and potential artificial intelligence or or maybe I'm missing it. But is that the yeah. kind of alignment thing? Yeah, the concept of AI alignment is how do you build advanced artificial intelligence systems that are, quote, aligned with human values and interests. In other words, they do things we would want them to do. They don't do things we would really, really not want them to do. So the Terminators were very unaligned <laughs> with human interests, right? Um, especially, not, especially in Judgment Day. <laughs> yeah. it's, but of course, it's not just a matter of potential physical violence. If, yeah. let's say, you have a, a trading bot that's handling your investments, mm -hmm. is it really aligned with you, or is it perhaps secretly aligned with the, the company that developed the, the mm -hmm. trading bot? Is it secretly trading on their behalf for their mm -hmm. interests? Yeah. Or if you have a, um, um, let's say, autonomous weapon systems that mm -hmm. are um, deployed in the battlefield, are those actually aligned with uh, your country's interests mm -hmm. or humanity's interests as a whole? Are they aligned with, you know, international rules of warfare? Mm -hmm. Are they aligned with the interests of local civilians? So the alignment problem is basically how do you try to make sure that AI behaves itself yeah, it's like in relation the, to human interests? 
Yeah, it's like the example of like the self-driving cars or whatever, right? It's like, you know, if there's, you know, someone walks out in the street and, you know, do they protect the person on the street or the four people sitting in the Tesla or <laughs> whatever it is? Who's making that decision? Who's programming it? How do they find it out in real time? You know, and if if you are aligning it to a human, <clears throat> I think Tesla actually does do this, right? In terms of like their lane shifting and stuff, like they have to like adapt to like how you drive and all these things. Or, or 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 your your kind of you know um uh features but it's one of those things where it's like <clears throat> well you know well aligning to human needs but what human right because exactly. if, you have, if you have a really fucked up human that's like i don't give a fuck about the person in the middle of the street i care about my family in the car so like ah shit i mean i I don't want to commit manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, but you know, it happens like accidents happen. You know, how is a, 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 an, an AI making that decision and how are they making that decision in real time? And then, yeah, you scale all the way up to like automated weapon systems. Uh, that's a big yikes, right? Because is it for all of humanity? Is it just a numbers thing? Which nation states, you know, what if it's something that's like, you know, you know, I mean, I know. <laughs> All countries always make ethical and moral response, uh, responsible choices in war. Of course they do, right? <laughs> of course, right? Of course. <laughs> so, you know, if we're if one country is going to murder millions of people in the name of fill in the blank, you know, how do you have an AI, we right, weapon system that's going to say, you know what, it doesn't matter if it's going to legitimately be against millions of people's well-being. It's serving the interest of the humans, whatever humans those are that developed it or that are in power in said nation state. Like, there's just so many problems with that. I mean, how do you, you can't, this almost goes back to the thing we were talking about earlier about individuality. You can't, I, right now, I just don't think you can, there, there's no formula for that. There's no, it's, plug and play here's the variables boom it's impossible right yeah and you know i've been thinking about this alignment problem i don't know for four or five years on and off i did a little flurry of research a few years ago and then the last few months i've really taken a deep dive into it and started publishing more on uh mm -hmm. forums like uh less wrong and ea forum mm -hmm. so i've got a few essays up on there the deeper I go into it, the more of an AI safety skeptic I get. Mm -hmm. I think you're right that, that, look, it's basically impossible for AIs to be aligned with humans in general if humans aren't aligned with each other. Yes. Like humans have conflicts of interest at the individual level, group level, corporate level, nation state level, ideological level, religious level. And a lot of my essays have been trying to remind the, uh, you know, the young computer science PhDs, bless their hearts, who work on this, right, right. that there's an awful lot of psychology they're neglecting, but there's also a lot of sociology yes. and political science and game theory that they're neglecting. Yes, yes. yes. So, for example, I did a thing on uh, alignment with religious values, mm -hmm. where I pointed out, look, the vast majority of people doing AI research are atheists, mm -hmm. but 80% of humanity is still involved in organized religion. Right. You know, the big ones are Christianity, Islam, um, Hinduism, Buddhism. Those religious values are extremely important to many, many people, billions of people. Yeah, yeah. How could AI align with, let's say, Catholic values as compared to uh, Sunni Islam values as compared to, you know, Hindu nationalist values. Very, very tricky. Very tricky. Yeah. Religions don't always play nice with each other. <laughs> no, they don't. But, but uh, this or is so I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But then this is where I feel like it becomes, I could, if I'm like looking in the future, I just see this. If you, if you just throw in economics in here, like people are going to develop their AI system. So this is this is my Catholic value AI kind of thing, and this is my you know Hindu thing, and 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 this, so we're just going to have our AIs 
almost be our avatars. They're going to just do all the fighting for us and blow shit up and, you know, or cause harm justifiably or, or not, inadvertently or not. I could just see where people curate their own kind of AI that fits their kind of values, which is, I don't know, there's, 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 I think, way more collateral damage that could happen in those scenarios not to say that there isn't collateral damage that we do now but it, i don't know that 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 maybe i'm wrong but but i just downstream that's where i see that kind of going yeah i think it's kind of an article of faith almost religious faith dare i say it that the ai safety researchers have mm. that there will be a common ground of human values that basically all humans share and at least we should build ai systems that are aligned with that uh, common ground, what some come sometimes called coherent extrapolated volition, the kind of like base level human interests that everybody shares. That's fine, but I don't think that exists. There are members of the voluntary human extinction movement who think humans should go extinct for the greater good of the ecosphere. Yeah. There are nihilists who mm -hmm. think Values are bad. We shouldn't have any values. There are antinatalists who think life is suffering, and the less life there is, the better. And if the universe was scoured of all life, it right. would be a better universe. Mm -hmm. There are not insignificant numbers of such people. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. they had AI systems, they would actually be rooting for the Terminators. Right, right. And I don't see any way around that. I think basically at this point where we don't have... Um, enough common ground in terms of human values, you know, developing powerful AI systems is basically like taking a bunch of toddlers in a daycare and, and giving them hand grenades <laughs> to, to, to like throw at each other and play with. Right. I, yeah. I mean, it's, it, but here's the dilemma though, right? The dilemma is AI is happening and it is being designed. And it is being pushed forward. So the conundrum here is, well, do we just wait around for people to figure out the sociological and psychological and all these other components and the philosophical, I guess, politically, you know, all these things, you know, or, or do we keep doing it and we don't have any of that and we just find out and then you have other problems, right? Based on how humans are interacting with them and they're, <laughs> there's no good answer <laughs> right it's just bad answers all the way down at the moment like you know one answer is you know in terms of a hierarchy here is is like well you know maybe it doesn't need to include everybody's ideas just the majority well there's, there's downsides to that you know this shouldn't be a democratic kind of thing we just you're just doing aristocracy all the all the smart people all the people that are just know this stuff and they got it they're just going to do it and everybody else, yeah, you know, you play along or you don't, I mean, there's problems with that. I mean, how do you, it, it is happening. You know, we have automated things at the moment and maybe, maybe that's some of the problem, right? Some of the problem with, I think current day, I'm, I mean, I'm not that old, but I sound old when I say this is that I think a lot of the times we're, 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 our, our technology is moving so fast in, 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 in some ways. And we just haven't got the ethics to catch up to it, right? Whether it's, you know, how do we use Twitter? How do we use the internet? How do we use Alexa? How do we use computers? How do we use TikTok? How do we use, you know, all of these different things, um, you know, data sharing, all these things, you know, what, what that's doing with currency, you know, all, all this stuff. We're just doing it. And then we're, we're having all of these issues. And then we're like, I don't know. No one thought about that, or maybe they did, but not not good enough. Or, and then we're getting all of this stuff and all these problems that are generated from that. So we see kind of small versions of that now. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I think you know another article of faith among the AI researchers is that um, if it's possible to develop advanced AI, transformational AI, artificial general intelligence, as they call it, that mm -hmm. that will happen and it will happen at the fastest possible rate. Because corporations are investing billions of dollars in the research and there's a geopolitical arms race 
between the U.S. and China yeah. that's driving AI. Mm -hmm. Okay, actually, most AI is being developed by corporations, not by governments. Mm -hmm. So it's basically Google, mm -hmm. Facebook, aka Meta, um, Tesla, uh, you know, etc. Mm. That's fine, but imagine a, a situation where there's some applications of AI that provoke such a dramatic public backlash, right? So much moral outrage or sexual disgust <laughs> that the majority of people decide, who AI is bad. We don't want it. We're going to stigmatize it. Maybe they're going to stigmatize AI as hard as they've stigmatized <laughs> evolutionary psychology. <laughs> or behavior genetics, or intelligence research, or eugenics, or mm -hmm. germline genetic engineering, right? Mm -hmm. That, to me, is very possible. Mm -hmm. And I've been working on an essay that tries to uh, game out some of the ways that that kind of public backlash against AI could happen. I think, in a way, if you, if you take AI risks seriously, um, look, Google is not going to voluntarily cut its AI development budget. They see potentially trillions of dollars of value that AI could create for them. Mm -hmm. China and the U.S. are not going to voluntarily give up their arms race. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think it's quite possible that there could be certain you know, applications of AI that might piss people off enough mm -hmm. that they just go, we don't want it, just like the people decided we don't want chemical warfare, we don't want biological warfare. Yeah, and, and yet, I mean, I agree. I agree. But yet, I, I feel like, I don't know. I feel like we've already, I feel like that train's already left the station or whatever. The, the ball's already rolling down the hill with all the other things we've done. And, and we, we, you know, people will, will <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, more recently, this is a stupid thing, but, you know, everyone was complaining about Elon Musk taking over Twitter and they're complaining on Twitter. And still keeping their accounts, right? You know, it, yep. it's you know, our people complain about oh, Amazon's so corrupt and all these things, and you know, whatever doesn't pays taxes, but everyone still do, does two day shipping from Amazon, mm -hmm. right? So there's, I think, when things become so instantiated within our daily lives, you know, cell phones and Apple and how they do things, you can complain about it, but you know, those companies are going to say. Yeah, go fuck yourself. Like you, you like it too much, don't you? You're gonna get rid of it. Okay, that's cool. Uh, maybe I lose a couple thousand people. That's fine. I still got millions more. Yeah. You know, and again, there, I, I, again, I'm not, I'm not making a, a moral judgment on this stuff. I mean, there's, there's, there's bad stuff on on all sides here. But I do wonder, we have enough already of a taste of it, where we're already using technology in our daily lives. Okay, what does that say? You know, about how we continue to to do stuff in the future. You know, again, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's it's unclear. It's to be determined. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, it, it it would take a really dramatic uh, thing. It would take yeah. something on the order of somebody releasing lethal autonomous weapon systems, mm -hmm. drone mm -hmm. swarms that let's say do uh, ethnic targeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right, yeah. that attack yeah. people of a particular skin color or race based on face recognition. Right, right. And where there would be such massive, widespread public condemnation and outrage mm -hmm. against that. Um, and where people realize this is an inevitable outcome yeah. of AI of a certain mm -hmm. type. Yeah. Right? Or you can imagine certain kinds of deep fake porn of political mm -hmm. figures that would outrage right. the political figures so strongly mm -hmm. that you get you know, congressional inquiries and you get extreme regulation and you get um you know public crackdowns on certain kinds of ai applications mm -hmm. it, so it, it would take something that was extremely uh morally disgusting to the majority of humans mm -hmm. yeah 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 that, that's that's hard to do i mean the only thing i can think of universally that people really get worked up about is um any types of pedophilia is usually the thing that's mm -hmm. there's no one's no one's, you know, uh, saying, eh, it's fine. It's not a big deal. I mean, everyone's yeah. kind of outraged by that. Yeah. Um, unless you're a Catholic church and you just turn a blind eye. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I had, to, I had to get that dig in there. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So before, before we, before we end here, just kind of a, um, 
sort of a sort of a do a popcorn round of sorts of things um obviously we could spend you know two hours in any of these topics but so let me ask you uh politically uh you know people people like your work but then they hate you politically right or they like you they like you in person but they hate your online presence or you know whatever, whatever these things are right um so you, you, do you do you hold the libertarian uh title or, or no you, you don't like you don't want to be boxed in what do you, what do you, where do you where are you at these days i would say I, i'm i'm at heart pretty much a libertarian and i have been ever since high school in like with regard to most domains and most issues i'm pretty libertarian however i do recognize there's a lot of domains where that really doesn't make much sense um you know i'm a real confusing patchwork of, of things <laughs> you know i'm <laughs> I'm kind of an extreme nationalist in some ways. I'm a libertarian in lots of ways. I'm, um, you know, a polyamorous Darwinian atheist in, in, in a lot of ways. And so this pisses off everybody on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's very confusing. And, you know, thanks to my followers who, who stick with me, even though I'm quite <laughs> confusing and a little hard to pigeonhole. Hmm. Um, but I really think the two-party system in the U.S. has got to be shaken up. And, you know, Andrew Yang, for all his faults, I think he's got the right idea in terms of trying to re-engineer the voting system to allow a broader variety of political parties to flourish with, like, ranked choice voting and open primaries. I think that's a good idea. Um, and I have very broad interests in terms of my political philosophers. I like to follow and read. And, like, you know, I met Curtis Yarvin uh, a number of times, AK. Uh, Moldbug. I think he has some very interesting analyses mm. of what's actually happening, even though I would sort of disagree with a lot of his um, proposals and suggestions. Mm. Um, and I like to be able to talk to people with a wide variety of political views. I have friends who go all the way from uh, pretty far lefty woke to pretty extreme right and everything in between. And I think that's important to keep one honest oh, yeah. in terms of, uh, you know, staying open-minded and staying, uh, you know, true to your um, epistemic values in terms of like mm -hmm. knowing why, why do you believe what you believe? Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean, you must be very high on openness to experience. <laughs> I, th I think I maxed out. Great. <laughs> You're the 97th percentile. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, on the, I guess on the libertarian thing and, and just kind of political party system, I mean, I mean, I hear this and like, I kind of get it in principle, but like, like if you look at the election of 1800, right, which Jefferson kind of stole, um, what happened there was that basically everybody fell into two camps and it's just kind of been that way since and I, it wasn't planned that way it wasn't intended i mean the founders didn't as far as i know didn't have a two-party system it was you know all these things and you know we had for a little bit you know the Whig party which is cool i like the Whig party Whig party was cool um and then that just kind of got subsumed and we had the republican party and then you know, you had the bull moose party for a little bit, you know, and then you've had other things, you know, other people in the but it's always been these two juggernauts. I think ideally, yeah, sure, maybe you could have that, but also I don't know. I mean, we just have a different system, unlike many countries in Europe where they have parliament and things like that, and different to you know, they do coalitions. You know, ours our stuff doesn't work that way, and especially with a country that's, you know, 330 million plus people. I don't know if that would happen well, and or if that was, I mean, it just kind of, it wasn't intended to be two party, but it, it just fell out that way. Yeah. And it's still that yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, if you have a first past the post voting system, uh, that's kind of a winner take all, then you immediately get into theoretical political science and the median voter theorem and you in inevitably get a two party split. That's mm -hmm. just the way things are structured and the founding fathers did not anticipate that because they didn't have game theory but <laughs> right, right. um the only way to overcome that in a stable long-term way is to change the way the voting system works to allow mm. other parties to flourish mm. um 
And, you know, other countries with other voting systems, like I lived in Britain for nine years, and uh, they actually have, at least at that point, three viable parties, <laughs> um, labor right. conservatives, liberal, liberal Democrats. Yeah. And a lot of European countries have a wider diversity of parties that represent mm -hmm. people a little more accurately. Mm. Um, so I don't think you can overcome that bipartisanship just by preaching at people or mm -hmm. asking Elon Musk to change how Twitter works or <laughs> trying to get more equal representation of, of conservatives in the New York Times. That's not mm -hmm. the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, also, obviously, having a national divorce where conservative areas split from liberal areas, mm -hmm. if you keep the same voting system, then within the conservative areas, you'll end up with a split between like the fundamentalist Christians and the libertarians, mm. you know? Yeah. And, and so you don't solve the bipartisanship through cultural preaching. You have to solve it by changing the voting system. Yeah. Interesting. I would, I, it would be an interesting experiment in the U S I wonder how much just organically would happen. Um, be, it'd be interesting. So it seems like you're kind of like, uh, like kind of one of the real libertarians, right? There's kind of all these different kinds of, uh, uh, versions out there kind of pseudo libertarians, but you're, you're in for the limited government, you know, don't love all the political institutions. Uh, you know, you want strict rules on economic regulation redistribution. You know, what, what, are, how do you kind of see your branch or your version of libertarianism right what's the whole what's the trope uh, uh fiscally conservative socially liberal is that the whole is that the whole thing that people say so i don't know um how do you see it i guess one one approach is from the kind of monetary system perspective so like i've been big into crypto the last couple of years and i've read a lot about bitcoin and read a lot about the monetary system and the fed and so forth Mm -hmm. So I think there should be a separation between government and money. Mm -hmm. And the government should not have sort of the authority to dictate the medium of exchange mm -hmm. through printing it out of thin air. So I'm pretty skeptical about that. So you're the end the Fed guy. I'm kind of the end the Fed guy. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the point of the Fed allegedly was minimize um, the volatility of business cycles. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They really do not seem to have succeeded very well in that. Mm -hmm. And so part of my libertarianism is kind of focused on uh, money and finance and the economy and people being able to um, have the freedom to choose their medium of exchange and their banking system and their investments and insurance and all of that, not just in the U.S., but, but globally. Mm. Um, and part of my libertarianism is kind of about sexual relationships and the idea that uh, if you don't explicitly want a country that's founded on kind of Christian nationalism, then maybe government should not have a role in uh, marriage. Mm. Maybe marriage should be basically a private contract and maybe it should be able to take different forms with different people. Um, you know, there's game theoretic reasons why a marriage of two people is a hell of a lot simpler than a marriage among multiple people or polygyny or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not obvious to me that you could create like a plural marriage system that's stable or simple or that, that was good for kids. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, you know, uh, I think a, a libertarian would look at a lot of existing regulations and laws and say, it, maybe it's not the government's business to legislate anything in any direction about sexual relationships mm. or about how families form or about um, people's use of psychoactive substances mm. or any of that. Mm. Maybe the basic role of government should be, you know, protect the nation from outside hostility and try to keep the peace internally at the level of minimizing violent conflict between people. And that's about it. But the so government has a very, I mean, literally when I say limited role, I mean, just a very limited role, like just 
be there in case there's a fire in the building and you just extinguish it and both domestically and foreign otherwise it, it just doesn't need any any role or very minimal role in uh you know economic system and social systems and all these other aspects that's kind of your approach more or less that's my kind of default and then there's a part of me that's like really trad life and very traditionalist and that's like maybe america should be founded on judeo-christian traditions and maybe all this degeneracy should be punished and i have very mixed feelings about that um but i will say one one other business i think government should get out of is education um i really don't think public schools are a good idea because they've been taken over by ideologues and propagandists and I don't even think government should have much of a role in higher education um, or necessarily in funding very much uh, research other than stuff that is uh, directly militarily relevant. It's interesting you said this. You, you said you felt this way since you were in high school. And I feel like people... Uh, People have like maybe a libertarian phase or they, you know, they have like the Marxist socialist phase, they have the like conservative phase. And so it's definitely, it's interesting how that, I think people give libertarians a lot of shit and like, you know, um, I don't know if that's right or wrong and you know, people give everybody a lot of shit for being a progressive or a conservative or a moderate, you know, people are just always upset at one group or the other, but it seems like this is a. It has implications for your for your for aspects different aspects of your life but it sounds like it's been a constant thing for you like if you're saying you've been that way since you know uh, your teens or your early 20s you know, it's, been, it's been pretty pretty stable i honestly think there's some genetic heritability to this mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of people in my extended family who have um pretty similar views and i really don't think it's just acculturation sure. or civilization sure um, and it comes in phases, you know, I had like a high school peak libertarianism and then in grad school, um, actually it was evolutionary psychologist, Lita Cosmides and John Tooby. Mm -hmm. Like you should read Robert Nozick. You should read, um, more <laughs> Hayek. You should read this and that libertarian <laughs> stuff. And, um, I was like, oh, that's why they're interested in voluntary social exchange. <laughs> part of human nature. It clicks um, now. And they've been, they've been pretty, um, open about that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, then once you, once you get involved in, uh, Twitter politics, mm -hmm. um, and you're kind of a centrist and you kind of don't trust either the Republicans or Democrats, and you want some kind of home, something to call yourself other than just a uh, wishy-washy centrist, um, then you kind of end up being a little bit in the libertarian camp just because, it seems like one of the few intellectually coherent positions that isn't mm. traditionally partisan. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, I, I'm definitely centrist in a lot of ways. And I guess you could say moderate liberal and in, in, in a lot of other ways, you know, there's, there's some very new uh, differences there. And, and I've been, um, people have tried to use as an insult to me, like I'm just a conservative or, you know, I'm a, I'm a libertarian. I, I get that a lot. You know, he's just a libertarian. And, um, <laughs> and you know for me it's like that's nah, not true um i mean i believe in strong centralized federal government so <laughs> you can't be libertarian or conservative if you believe in that now i have but the thing is it's in culturally and even how much of that or whatever but i i i have uh i would say pretty moderate liberal but i also distrust um and dislike much of the right and the left as political parties in the united states not because it's a trendy thing or something like that, but because of, um, I think they're very foolish in how they do things. And more, more importantly, it's not always accurate to uh, many different people's needs in the United States. And that frustrates me because it's, 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 you know, it's just kind of becomes like a game instead of, you know, what it is that it needs to try and impact people. And, and there's a lot of good people out there on, on both sides, right? <laughs> right. You know, there are some good, good, really good conservative folks out there. There's some good liberals out there. Um, you know, good libertarians, independents, and so. But yeah, I'm usually somewhere in the moderate liberal section. 
Yeah, and you know, to me, uh, from an evolutionary point of view, I'm I'm focused on kind of the brass tacks of like survival and reproduction. So to me, any political party that that mm. developed a platform that said our goal is to make it possible for an average person of average intelligence, average conscientiousness, mm. to uh, you know find a mate, be able to have kids, have a house, and have meaningful work by age thirty. Like I would sign up for that. That mm. to me is the key function of, of yeah. government insofar as it has any function is to help people be able to, you know, form families and and reproduce in peace <laughs> with some degree of dignity and mm. and, and freedom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no, I and, and I firmly agree with you there. Well, Jeffrey, it has been uh fantastic talking with you for a couple hours you're very generous with your time um i i really i really uh feel fulfilled uh getting to talk to you about so many things many things i wanted to talk to you about for a while um i'm sure listeners will really enjoy this where um where's the best place to find you as you said you know you have uh, a handful of books out i sense another one in the tank somewhere <laughs> you might not say it but i sense it so um but where can people i guess find your books and where can they find you online and all those great places you know mostly i'm online way too much on twitter as uh primal poly yeah and my website is primalpoly.com, and that's got all my books and my papers and a bunch of interviews and links and of course syllabi and all kinds of good stuff so those are the two main things yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, you're, 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 again, uh, it's a big, uh, big honor to talk to you and uh, very, very generous with your time. And so uh, I greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs>